Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. Good afternoon, Michael Malice here. Let that be your welcome for the next hour. One of the best parts of my job, besides being in my underwear 25-8, is that I get to make shows where I catch up with friends of mine that everyone else seems to like. And that is what we're doing today. We have with us returning guest, show favorite, personal favorite, Bridget Fetessy, host of Walkins Welcome. You can see her at fetessy.locals.com. She was the first one recruited for Locals. And correctly so, I was number two. I'm Buzz Aldrin here uh, to your <laughs> Neil Armstrong. Um, uh, and Dumpster Fire is your other show. So she's a one woman content factory. I'm a one man garbage factory. Why would you have a factory to make garbage? Does it make sense? Well, here I am. Bridget, how have you been? <laughs> I've been good. Good. Yeah, I've, I love it. I, I've been loving life. Everybody in my community, by the way, we just finished our Sarah Connor workout that we have. And the women all say, Oh my God, tell Malice we said hi. They're they're so excited that I'm talking to you. They love you. There's I a have, lot of overlap. I have a question to ask you that is gonna be a little obnoxious. Okay. Uh, because I and because I know my answer, and it was such a weird question. I've seen this more than once, but I'm like, let me ask Bridget her answer because it was so um uh outside my mindset that I didn't even understand how the person was asking this question, okay. I like questions like that. Yeah. So they were like, okay, you should be scared because it's an obnoxious (laughs) question. They said, why does Bridget have such a big following? Like, I don't get what is so appealing about her. And I, when I saw this, I I had like a little speech, but I want to hear your speech. Then I'll give you my speech. Oh, um, wow. That is a good question. And then I started weeping. You can tell them (laughs) she started weeping. I don't know why I have a big following. I think um, you know I know certain ju- things work and certain things don't with with your audience. Yeah, I get this a lot. I mean, it's funny to me as somebody who's so when I moved to L.A. It was to create content. And it's hilarious because every time I go on Rogan, for example, all the comments are like, who is this chick? She's just a t- Twitter celebrity. She's a nobody. She doesn't do anything for tweet. And it's like, I have, I do more than anyone I know. I have a podcast. I have a show. I'm always working. Yeah. I write a monthly column. I'm writing a book. Like, how much do I need to do before someone's like, oh, she's a valid human that does things? Wait, you know what I love about this? <laughs> who is this chick? All she does is create content. Why am I listening to her? <laughs> <laughs> who is this bitch who's just putting feeding the algorithm literally all day long of her life every day for your free entertainment? You freaking commie. Um, <laughs> no, I just um, I think on Twitter, it's it's outsized. Because. I just know how to use Twitter. Okay. <laughs> like, Twitter is fun to me. I like it. And so much of Twitter is just hitting the right time you know you just hit something at the right time or make a joke right in the zeitgeist and then it just kind of does its thing I got lots of followers there were multiple episodes of large groups of followers on Twitter some of which occurred before stumbling into the culture wars just weird things like Judd Apatow retweeted me once and I, I just kind of understood the game. Like to me, I, it's kind of like a video game. It's fun. Um, so there's that, but then I, that's just my medium. I don't have tons of followers on Instagram. You know, people are like, Oh, why does she have such a big audience? It's actually not that big. It's just very engaged. (laughs) They they seem larger than they really are. It's like a very small, but loud army. (laughs) Well, that's what I, that was my answer. My answer is several things. First of all, that she's very hardworking. Second, that you're self-deprecating. So you don't take yourself seriously. So that makes you, um, engaging with people that makes you sympathetic. You really seem to be very into caring about your audience and giving them actionable, useful advice to further their lives and take an interest in that, which I think is pretty rare. And I think is pretty impressive. Like there is this kind of like, I don't know if you're going to 
this is going to come out of nowhere because I just thought of it. But there is this Jordan Peterson aspect to you. I hear you... this a lot, actually. Oh, you do? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I thought I was being all original. Okay. No, no. I hear it a lot, weirdly. But there's a big part of you that's like, all right, like, we got some problems. Let's figure it out. We're going to mess up along the way. And that's cool. Um, but you should, you can be a happier person tomorrow than you are today. I was a mess. I'm the, I'm the first one to tell you I was a mess. Here's some mistakes I made. Maybe you'll learn from them. Maybe you won't, but just try it. And I think that spirit of kind of like, okay, guys, you know, we're, we're basically on a lifeboat. Like, can we at least play charades <laughs> to pass away the time? <laughs> because we're going to be stuck on this lifeboat. So at least let's have a good time about it. Yeah, that's accurate. And I also think I just want to have fun. Yeah. You know, I, I still feel very optimistic. There are days where I absolutely don't. But there for the for the overarching mood of mine, I feel mostly in control over. And when I'm not feeling optimistic, it means I'm not doing enough, not to sound all woo, but like spiritual work um, on, on myself and in my life. And I'm focusing too much on either results, compare and despair, outside circumstances that are out of my control, many things that I don't have any, any real, I can, I can spin out easily thinking about things in the world like Syria, you know, <laughs> that, that can make me be like, oh, the children. And, and there has to be something I can maybe take an actionable step towards. But and this is maybe where people see a lot of the Jordan Peterson. But again, this is also very just basic principles of kind of 12 step program, which yeah. is clean your fucking room. You know, you I know so many people who might be online all day keyboard worrying and I'm sure their lives are just a disaster because I don't know that they I'm convinced like you're looking right people, at me. You're looking right at me. <laughs> do you wear diapers? No, no. <laughs> you're not. You're not on. You are not on at all hours of the night. There are some people where I'll log in and they're, I'm like, do you sleep? Is everyone on Twitter just on Adderall? Bridget, I have a team. I'm illiterate. None of those. I just yell into my box thing and I say, hey, put this up. And they go, do, 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 do. And then they uh, tell me everyone likes it. I'm just like the former president that way. OK, that that makes more sense to me. That can explains. They, uh, I have uh, several friends who are in recovery and I am extremely impressed by some things they take away that they can apply to their day-to-day -day lives. I don't think people realize, I said to my friend on the phone, Jackie, she's in um, LA now, shout out to Jackie, that people in 12-step are more into personal responsibility than even like Ayn Rand objectivists. <laughs> like, every, but the, right? But you guys are so obsessed with it because there's one of the things is, what was your role yeah, in this. And that's... the example she used on the phone, she's like, no, no, we take it to the extreme of, OK, my dad beat and raped me and I'm <laughs> resentful. What was my role in all this? And it's just like, you know, I think on that one you get a pass And she's like, no, you still have to figure out maybe your emotional response is yeah. not proportionate to what he did. Or it's I mean, it's funny because there's a lot of criticism of this in 12 step and it isn't necessarily like, for instance, my rapist, you know, like it's like, obviously I was a victim in this situation. However, I had to look at how that was affecting my life today. Yeah. So am I being hypersexual? Am I not looking at something in my relationships? There are things that play out that I do have control over emotionally and in other ways that things. Am I attached to an identity of victimhood? Am I looking for an easy way out? Uh, there, another big one that came up when I was doing all this work, because it's a lot of work and yeah. it's not comfortable, was um, entitlement. I was like, wow, I'm really fucking entitled. And I didn't even really see how entitled I was until I looked at why I feel like I deserve all these things or why I feel resent. You know, on the other side of resentment is usually a sense of entitlement yeah. somewhere. And so that was very fascinating. Pride was another one that I was, you know, very surprised at how much that played out. And and from situations where it is a lot of personal responsibility because it would be very easy for me to this is why I can't stand our cu current culture. The victimhood narrative gets you nowhere. It is a dead end. Yeah, it's a dead end in your life. And my lesbian rehab that I went to in 20 and the, all the women who were lesbians and who 
were kicking my butt when I went to my first rehab and only rehab at 19. But the first time I got sober, they they were constantly drilling that into us like this will get you nowhere. It ends it ends ends in nothing because you are always going to be looking for a reason to be a victim and never taking responsibility for your life. And it's very easy and it's lazy and it's now it's become monetized in our culture. Yeah. So this is St. Patrick's week. So I thought I'd talk to an Irishman lady, Ah, Uh, but let me talk about how my heritage informs this perspective, Mm. you know, coming from the Soviet union, being raised with Russian values in our household, we spoke Russian Um, to be like weak or be a victim and to talk about this publicly, (laughs) the way Russians look at like, especially men who act like this. No, it's more like, it's basically being like, kind of like a pedophile. It's like you're you're disgusting. You're not even really human. Like, how are you allowed to walk the street? No, it's just this very it's it's just it's not even that because that's articulate. It's a very visceral aversion. Like, oh, my God, mm-hmm. you're so gross. Get away from me. It's one mm-hmm. thing if someone said I had these awful things happen to me. Here's how I took ownership. Here's how I'm a better person for it. Here's how I conquered blah, blah. But to just sit there and be like, yeah, you know, all society craps on me. Uh, it, it, it's like such deaf yeah. ears and it's just like you well goodbye I don't want you around me you're probably bad luck it's <laughs> so to have this American thing where victimhood is actually perceived as somehow a, a, in a warped sense an accomplishment is so bonkers to my psychology both as a kid and as everything I've thought since that when I see someone parading about how poorly they're treated everywhere I my only brain goes I'm sorry but this is you because if you're this weak, it's like an animal. So, you know, if there's like the dog is injured, the other dogs all kill him. And it's just like, yeah, that's that's what, what do you want them to do? Not kill the dog. It's it's so crazy to me. It's interesting you say this because I was married to a Belarusian, as you know, and he was, you know, right off the boat, my ex-husband. And like therapy made no sense to him. You know, it was just like something. And every single person I know from Eastern Europe or from like Russia, they just don't. Therapy is like, why? Why would you do that? (laughs) They just don't understand it at all. And he he was like, what am I going to do? Just like go talk about it. (laughs) Which is funny because Russian literature, it's also introspective and dark and deep. You would think that yeah, but it's know. introspective. You're not talking right. to somebody. You're sitting there in your house and like thinking things through and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you call one of your boys or like grandma or something, <laughs> but like some some soy boy who's got a notepad. How does that make you feel? I'm paying you for answers. I yeah. can do this at home for free it's or funny. I can take it out on somebody. My therapist is she's from the Nordic countries. And okay. so she's very practical. Yeah. And, you know, we laugh a lot in our sessions and she's just so give it to me straight. And I need that. She's not orthodox in the way it's like, well, how does okay. that make you feel? She'll be like, no, that's a dumb idea. <laughs> Therapists aren't normally supposed to do that. She'll be like, how about no, that's not smart. <laughs> and she's very much into personal responsibility and we did a lot of work uh, around victimhood and yeah. just getting out from under that mentality. There, there are things that happened that I think asking why I have an audience, I think one of the reasons is that I pretty much I'm an open book too. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty open about what's happened to me. And there are things that I have not even revealed yet that maybe I won't ever that are actually when people are like, you're so brave for talking about this. I feel almost like a fraud because the really hardcore stuff I don't actually talk about because I don't feel like airing a lot of my family's dirty laundry and it doesn't feel like appropriate, you know, just, yeah, of course it would affect other people in my family and life for me to have those conversations. But that was the more gnarly stuff that I had to really overcome and do work around. And I think that you can, you can, you can change your life. I just don't, I don't understand the idea that you're like this victim of circumstances, especially well, you do in understand. our country. Hold on, hold on. Cause you just mentioned compare and despair, right? Right. So someone can say, I'm, let's suppose you want to be a politician. You're going to say, I can never be president. But you, what you point out is you don't have to be president. You could just be a better person tomorrow than you are today. You are never going to be Joe Biden. You're never going to be Donald Trump, but you can be a name in your own right and achieve a lot and like standups, right? 
there's plenty of stand-ups that you and I probably haven't heard of. Maybe this is before COVID, obviously, who make a perfectly good living going out there and making people laugh. They're working comics. They make decent money and they're living the dream. Yeah, they're not on NBC, but they're still working artists, which is a major, major accomplishment. So yeah. that compare and despair thing you mentioned where like everyone has to be Hemingway. When I first wanted <laughs> to be an author, you know, I, I read this book by Dennis Johnson, who's now deceased, called Jesus' Son, which became a superb movie. And I, I, I almost quit immediately because I'm never going to be able to be this yeah. good of a writer. And you know what? I was right when I was 20 and read that book because I will never be as good of a writer as Dennis Johnson. And who cares? I don't, yeah. We already have Dennis Johnson. We don't need yeah. another Dennis Johnson. I could be my own mediocre writer who's putting out crappy books, but people seem to like them for some reason. Yeah, no. And I think for me, when I get into the compare and despair, it means I'm, again, not focusing enough on the process. I'm focusing more on results and yeah. feeling, again, entitlement. Like, oh, I deserve what X, Y, Z person is getting or 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 this feeling of, and again, too, it comes from it's it's a weird it comes from like the outside in and then the inside out, because there's also just old feelings of worthlessness that I'm almost constantly dealing with that will reinforce those feelings yeah. of I'm, I'm just a fraud. Yeah, 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 I'm a fraud and I'm not enough. That's the baseline. Yeah, yeah. I wake up with that every morning and then it's like I have to do freaking meditation and say a prayer and like do a gratitude list. <laughs> like, yeah, just to get to maybe I'm not a fraud and maybe I'm worth something. It well, you know takes what it, effort. You, you know what it is? I think it's the idea, not just that you're a fraud and you're, you think that you're a fraud, but you the corollary with that is. I'm a fraud and then tomorrow everyone's going to figure it out and then this is all going to go away. And then what do I do? What's my plan B? And you don't have a plan B. And, and that's, but that's not really realistic, but your brain is telling you, I love the idea that in, like our, our, our brains are so demented that your brain is telling you spontaneously, everyone is going to have this epiphany overnight and it's all going to vanish immediately as if that were possible. By the way, though, you started this interview with a question from people basically asserting that I'm a fraud, you know, like they're wondering who is this girl and why is she, she's a fraud. Sure. In, in that question is the very fear that I have of like, Oh, they figured me out, <laughs> you know? Okay. Well, I did not want to touch a nerve. I'm no, sorry no, if I did. Okay. No, no, I'm not saying that it does touch a nerve. I actually love when my buttons are pushed or those nerves are touched because then it gives me an opportunity to look at them. But I I've heard this many times. I hear this all the time. And I know that every time I hear it, it's, it, it touches on that exact fear of, oh, they figured me out. <laughs> like, well, I think oh, these it, people know. <laughs> I truth. think we also have different approaches because I very much carry myself uh, as aloof, holier than thou, you know, hands off velvet rope. And you're someone who, if they go to the museum, you're like the petting zoo that the kids can play with you and touch you and <laughs> hang out with you, right? I, I'm the rare dangerous species that you can't even come near it. There's only a picture. You're looking in the corner. Is that it? Is that it? Is it, it looks like that. Is that it? Is it sleeping? But the thing is, that then is it's just like- I've ever heard. <laughs> but like then it's like, zoo. how am I looking up to this person as a public figure if she's just like my pal? So right. there's going to be that tension there where they feel very friendly to you, like they know you because you are an open book. But then it's like, I know my friends. My friends aren't public figures. Who is this broad? So <laughs> I think it goes into that as well, a, a little as well. It's not the fraud aspect. It's the familiarity aspect. I mean, I might be a fraud. <laughs> you're not a fraud because you're not even pretending to be anything. All you're pretending to be is someone with opinions who runs her mouth. That's yeah. factual. Yeah. You don't and even just, have that many opinions to be honest. You're, I you're really more don't. like like walking around like, all right, like what's happening here? I don't understand. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> right. I don't have that many opinions. The, I And I mostly, you know, I was noticing something yesterday when everybody was getting mad about the Grammys last night. And I was like, inject the conservative commentary directly into my veins tomorrow. And it's I realized that I have this really sick and I've talked to my therapist about this. I'm not addicted to outrage because I very rarely get outrage. I'm addicted to other people's outrage. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, maybe I am a sociopath. And she's like, no, you just like pushing buttons. I just get off on it. I, I, think can't, really I, can't, I can't relate. I'm like a monkey throwing poo at a zoo. That's what I am. No, you're the sheep. Remember, you're the petting zoo. We're only going to have one zoo metaphor. It confuses the audience. They can't okay, have simultaneous yeah. thoughts in their heads. I'm a sheep. Yeah. Or you, what's the coolest animal in the petting zoo? 
Probably like a goat, a baby the goats goat. Are, the goats are cool. A baby goat you do yoga with. <laughs> yeah, oh, they're really cute. And they can jump on your back. Yeah. Yeah. You oh, they're yoga they're so that. adorable. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm a zoo. I'm an animal freak. I'm a zoo freak. Um, and my friend, both his parents own zoos in Prague. So I once went on a plane just so I can go to all the zoos and I got to play with two aardvarks, which was really a oh, bucket wow. list kind of thing to have happen. Yeah. And now he got deported back to Czech Republic. <laughs> oh no. Yeah, I, love yeah. Prague. Prague I, didn't, cool. I didn't love it. I felt like it was too, um, it wasn't weird enough for me. If I'm going ah. to like central Eastern Europe, I want it to be bonkers. Okay. Like what's your favorite place? I, I haven't traveled enough, but for this okay. year, for my birthday, um, for in July, if it's open, me and Chris Williamson, he hosts the modern wisdom podcast. We're going to go to the motherland to see ah. the place where I was born, which I haven't been back since I was two. Oh, wow. So that's going to be really fun and intense and horrible because Russian and Ukrainian people are really horrible. Yeah. They, they are very opinionated and they will tell you that you need to speak better Russian and they'll have and all sorts of fat. advice. Yeah. <laughs> oh, don't, 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 even, don't put that there. Don't, don't, don't say that. No, 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 no. We're on, a, we're on a cut right now and it's going too slow and it's causing all sorts of issues in my mind. Oh, really? Let's talk about it. Okay. Let's talk about it. Go ahead. Because I'm in the same place. You're tell in a me cut? about your, I don't know what that means, but tell me about what that, what that means for you. Okay. Being on a cut means you have, you're losing weight in a very scientific controlled way. It's a way to normalize an eating disorder. Right. So the thing is, when you're losing weight, you're also going to lose strength. Right. So you have to do this insane balancing act where you're losing just a little weight. So you're not losing any strength. OK, but it's glacial. And how and you do you do this with like guidance from a trainer? Yeah, yeah, you have macros. You eat the same thing every day and then you weigh uh, yourself in the morning and have you take a waist measurement. And because you have body dysmorphia, you don't trust the mirror, then you have to trust the numbers. But the numbers are moving very slowly. Like I had the same waist now for 10 days. It messes with your head. Why are you trying to lose weight? Yeah, I'm trying to get my cum gutters back. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. When I lost those, it was a bigger tragedy than basically 9 11 because it happened to me. <laughs> and, and the Bush family wasn't behind this. This is all COVID's fault, which I guess they could have had some involvement with the Saudis now that I think about it. Follow the really? dots, Bridget. Follow the dots. <laughs> I'm following. This is kind of like me losing my computer. I'm borrowing um, my husband's computer, and mine has been in the shop for like a week. And I've been wandering around and I'm like, now I know what it's like to have a phantom limb. And everyone's like, calm down, Bridget. <laughs> but I keep thinking about going to do something and I can't do it. I'm like, oh, I'm going to, oh, I can't. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to, I can't do that either. <laughs> it's, so, it's so sad and it's tragic because it's happened to me. Hey guys, Michael Malice here. Want to tell you about Sheath Underwear, a sponsor that works with both me and the lovely Bridget Fetissey. Uh, what is sheath underwear? If you go to sheathunderwear.com and use promo code MALICE20, you get 20% off your order. Here's how it's different from every other box to brief you've ever worn. First of all, it's the most comfortable. But what makes sheath unique is they have this dual pouch technology, which holds and supports the two parts of your male anatomy. And I just spoke to Bridget. The girl stuff, the girl underwear, which they have, and they have a matching bra, which she swears by and wears, they don't have this pouch technology. It's just very comfortable stuff. But of course, since no women listen to this show, by law, you don't care about that. But if you go to sheathunderwear.com and use promo code MALICE20, you get the guy boxer briefs, you get the t-shirts, which I like to wear at the gym. They're stretchy. Or you could have the girl stuff for, I was going to say the girlfriend in your life, but we know that that's not the case. So let's get back to the show and support Sheath Underwear, the underwear that supports you. So the last time I was on Rogan, um, he completely shot down my idea of doing reverse prank phone calls. Um, and you were going to be the second or third person I did it to. <laughs> and the premise was while I was on Rogan, I was going to text someone and say, I'm really sorry for what I said about you on Joe Rogan <laughs> and wait for the phone to light up and, and for the person to freak and call in or start texting violently. He was not having it at all. He's like, this is stupid. Put your phone away. I don't like trolling. Like he was just like totally not having it. Because he's a good man. <laughs> well, I'm not. What would you have done if you got that text from me? Ah, that's interesting. I mean, it's hard to guess. Well, because there's the answer that I want to think that I would give and the answer that I might get that I, I don't know in the moment if it was real. Right. I, I think if you had texted me that I would have assumed that the interview is already done and I would have been like, what did you say? 
Okay. <laughs> you know, I think I probably just would have texted back like, oh no, what did no, you say? Then I would have said, I already, I knew that was coming. Okay. So I would have said, don't worry about it. I'm going to ask him to cut it out. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what a diva he can be. I was going to say that in front of him. <laughs> that was, that would have been the bit. I wouldn't have called you. Okay. Yeah, I definitely know that about myself. I, I think I, I I expect like people to talk shit about me um, publicly. And I know that you would even if you were jokingly doing it, it might be one of those things that you like were jokingly saying okay, something yeah. about me. So I would assume you were making some joke that went too far and said something about me. This would be my assumption. OK, yeah. Malice wasn't being malicious. He was just saying talking some shit and making a joke that went too far. And I was somehow in this joke. Yeah, so that's probably the worst that would actually happen in, in all honesty. Yeah. And then I probably would have texted you and been like, oh no, what did you say? Okay, okay. So it would have <laughs> this would have been like a lead balloon. I need to find I someone. Would have been who, lame. Yeah, I need I was gonna work up until like people who are just really kind of <laughs> like neurotic and totally spurging out. So it would have been baby steps by people I knew I could trust and, and so on and so forth. So tell me about how bad California is at the moment and what is the vibe on the street about the Gavin Newsom recall? Um, it's really bad. I feel like I'm living in a city that's on hospice, you know, oh, wow. still, <laughs> I mean, no, it's worse. It's actually somehow it's shocking how bad it is. Even when I went down to deal with my computer, I had to go to the third street and there's still businesses boarded up that got destroyed. They were, they had riots or like they were smashing things downtown two nights ago what? because the, yeah, because of, there was a Brianna Taylor March and uh -huh. they ended up destroying a bunch of businesses. It's so it's really violent. Somebody got stabbed. Wait, why isn't the media reporting on the fact that white supremacists are smashing windows at a Breonna Taylor march? <laughs> yeah, it's not not exactly who's smash doing the smashings. Oh, OK. It's like in cells. What block? It, it's Antifa, basically. Mm. Um, that actually and, makes more sense. Yeah. And some BLM, but it seems more like the the black block or whatever they call themselves. Yeah. Um, so they were doing a bunch of, you know, property damage. And then there were these like just really upsetting and disturbing videos that came out from it of, you know, a guy who's like, I'm on your side. Why are you destroying businesses? And like, they're like, are you fucking kidding? And they pushed him down the sidewalk. They're like, you're worried about glass. Like people are being gunned down in the streets. And I was like, this lie is so toxic. It is wow. and it, the lie that there are thousands of people being gunned down in the streets by yeah the police is so damaging. And, you know, Michael Shermer just did that whole study that came out where they interviewed Americans and asked them how many people unarmed black men they thought were um, shot in the past year. And but, it, they were guessing thousands. But the thing is, it's, he, he's I think he made a mistake because even you say armed black men, it's still not in the thousands. So even if you're saying people who absolutely were pulling guns in the police, how many of them did the police shoot in self-defense? The number is still astronomically small. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just uh, I see this. It's it's just I mean, talk about a toxic resentment that's not even based in reality that is co causing this insane, corrosive rift in our society and kind of destroying it. And they were it, they're just like the violence that's happening kind of on the regular and and even seeing these marches and all of this destruction i'm like okay where's all the like this is trump's america you can't say that anymore right so is this biden's america whose america is this now and just the homelessness i yeah. mean i was it's frustrating as someone who's now a small business owner just in my taxes and goes out my door and there's a lane of traffic that's got cones in it and you can't drive in because there's so much garbage from the homeless encampment that's on Wait, the seriously? street. Yeah. Yeah. It's I'm like this. You broke the social. The contract is broken. We had a deal. I don't feel safe walking my dog. A woman got um, shot in the leg when somebody jumped her the other day in Beverly Hills. Yesterday, somebody got their purse snatched and got stabbed in Santa Monica. Like this stuff is happening all 
the time. There was Lady Gaga's dogs got stolen and yeah. everybody was worried about the dogs. But I'm like, someone got shot. Yeah, her dog rocker got shot. Yeah, I just got back from Cape Town and I'm like, this is it, it's not the same by any means. But there is that heightened sense of constantly looking over your shoulder. And I've lived here for a long time, so it's changed like dr- dramatically changed since I've been here. Um, are you thinking of getting the heck out of yeah, there? I'm not saying I'm not saying. Wow. Because I don't feel safe. You yeah. you broke the deal. You I don't I shouldn't have to. I shouldn't ha- be paying the amount of money that I'm paying in taxes. They yeah. don't care about women. They do. They don't care about their citizens. They care more about, I guess, I, I don't know who they care about, but it's not the people who are paying taxes. What's plan B or C then for Richard Fetacy? Um, I think I, I really liked Texas when I was there. Okay. You know, I, I love my friend who lives there always says, keep Austin weird, but keep Austin surrounded. So yeah. I might go to help keep Austin surrounded. What do you mean by um, surrounded? Like it, Austin's very liberal, obviously, yeah, yeah. Yeah. but the whole idea is like, keep it surrounded by red and purple. Oh, you know? okay. like, so, keep so Austin where in weird. Texas are you thinking? Probably outside of Austin somewhere. Yeah. Oh, like just I mean, outside you mean? Yeah. I don't think I'd live in Travis County just because taxes and, um, just policies are very similar to Los Angeles, but there are count there are counties that are outside of Travis that are very much still red, purple, and um, not as liberal. So, if I end up living there, I don't know. I might just go try it out and like rent a place. You know? Yeah, I, I've I've been thinking about like all my friends went to Austin, um, and apparently people also talking about Miami. But when Nashville. I was just there, yeah, I was I, I didn't like it because it didn't have a like a neighborhoody vibe. Like Miami. There no, Austin didn't. Oh, OK. There's like no place where you could go and just walk around for a long period of time. And like, yeah, you're not going to really find that many places other than New York or L.A. Maybe yeah. Boston, but who's going there? But it's even just... L.A., no one's walking around, you know, that. Uh, but there are plenty of places in L.A. you could take a long walk. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think that. They're those big strips. They go on forever. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I'm not. Um, I feel like there's energy there. You know, there's there's yes, a lot that of, is a plus. Yeah, there's just a lot of energy. And I don't necessarily like to be the person that's doing the thing that everybody else right. is doing. I, either. I, I resist that. But I also don't want to be the person that's looking and being like, why the hell didn't I go there? It's and all my friends. You, you know, know what, you don't want to be the last one standing. Like if all my friends are buying Bitcoin at 100, I don't want to be like, OK, well, whatever. It's too late now. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, you could have bought it 200 and still made a killing. So, yeah, yeah. I just, and a lot of people, I feel that um, ideologically, it's just more in alignment with where I am. It's it seems more diverse. You can get to Dallas to go see yeah. all the people at the blaze if you want. You know, there there's plenty of I could shoot over to Nashville. I there I like the idea. I feel that being where I am, even in the culture wars, which I feel is very independent. I yeah. feel very independent. Why not move to the middle of America? It feels like the right. I loved living in Minnesota when I was growing up. I hated the cold. OK, but I love the Midwestern work ethic and I love the sense of family and community. And I think I don't know, there was just I had a good every time I've gotten to Austin, I've had a great time. I've never not Oh, had I had an amazing there. time. Like I had yeah. an absolute amazing time. I was just wondering if I'd be able to. On the other hand, if I don't ever leave my house, which is my MO, it might be, um, uh, doesn't matter really where my house is. I got, it was just really funny because I've got such, a, I've talked about this in other shows. I've got such a big crew there. They're like, uh, one of my buddies, Matt, he's like, I will come to your house and pack up your crap for you myself. Like if that's what's stopping you, you know, that's not going to do it. My other friend, she's like, I don't know how to drive. We're here now. I'll, we'll take driving lessons together. I'm like, you guys can make it really hard to say no. The rents, like, this is the thing being a New Yorker all my life. Yeah. I'm so delusional when people say like, oh, the rents are cheaper. I think, yeah, whatever. Cause LA for a long time was competitive with New York on rent. And now it's roughly the same. It's not really that much cheaper, but like a bachelor pad in New York, like a Brooklyn loft, where here, which I would never pay, is like eight grand. Like there, it's like three. Even the prices so that are going up, yeah, are, because they are, it's still ridiculously cheap. And just from let let me talk about just a business perspective. Yeah, what I'm paying in 
payroll taxes to myself. You know, I what I'm paying in business taxes, what I'm paying in personal taxes to the state of California compared to what I would be paying in Texas. It makes it easier for I am. This is where I feel like the left does not understand how important small businesses are to America. I don't want to save money so that I can um, just save a lot of money and hoard it. I want to hire my cousin Maggie and Sam so that we can all work together and make stuff and have this be our full time job. I want to I want to employ people. I want to bring creativity and energy. And that's that's the feeling when I moved to L.A., you could the cool thing about Austin right now and Nashville, too. The market's so hot. When I moved to L.A., you basically had to have money in hand and ready to get whatever place you could get because everybody was this was in 2007 when I came back and everybody was moving here. There was so much energy and it was creative and I just felt that up surge of energy and youthful energy. And now it feels, I mean, there are fallouts from this stuff that no one's talking about. Like yeah. they kick the can down for rent and for mortgages to with the new bill until July. How many people in these cities, particularly even in rent control departments are basically squatting right now, right. haven't paid rent in almost a year which makes no sense because a lot of the people were getting extra unemployment and they were told they didn't need to pay rent. Like it should have been one or the other, you know, yeah. we're going to give you more money, but still pay your rent. Cause if you couldn't pay $1,200 at the beginning of this, you're not going to come up with 10 at the yeah, end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're all in come um, August and the fall, the foreclosures are going to start all across America. We're massive. And they're, all they're the not going to let them. They're not going to let them. You don't think there's no way they're going to let them. No, 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 no. They'll what figure it, something out. They'll just pay off the banks. I don't know. I you mean, really think, do you really think the Washington is going to allow America to see mass foreclosures and mass um, gigging evictions when they could very easily just write a big check and print the money? And oh, of God, course they're going to do that. That's so bad. That, this, is, this is why all your money should <laughs> be in crypto because the dollar is on the verge of collapsing. I know it's got to be. And when you have inflation that hurts the poorest people the most, people yeah. who have money don't care if this apple is a dollar at this store or a dollar yeah. fifty at that store. When we first came to this country, my mom told me they would walk to the the store on this corner and uh, on in Bensonhurst to see how much the fruit was. They'd walk all the way to the other, and if it was five cents difference, they would walk all the way back because that made a difference. And when you're like an immigrant or you're like working poor, that stuff adds up and you yeah. feel guilty over wasting 50 cents a dollar whatever it is nowadays this was in the early 80s so and they don't care yeah they don't care like i i mean it, it's interesting because back in the day the democrats i don't want to say the left i want to specifically say the democratic party was very much about caring about the poor talking about it safety net and now i don't think there's any pretense Right. I think it's so much about minorities and so much about, um, you know, identity politics and anti-Trump. And it's just like, uh, if you ask me who I'm most worried about, it's the poor people. I am because too. Because they're the ones who are the good, most likely to be screwed by definition. This is this this is what I've been screaming about the entire pandemic, especially like the school closing things. Because I see it. I see. I. I. It's funny to me sometimes when I when when particularly white liberals come after me on Twitter they'll be screaming at me and blue checks and they'll be like, oh, so I guess you just hate Mexicans. And I guess I'm like, if you had any people in your life who are actually you were friends with, you would yeah. know that they're not all a monolith. I know tons of of Latin men who are Trump supporters. I know it. it's not as everybody thinks putting them in this like one monolith is the most racist thing yep. to me. And knowing so many of people who are all over and different, like all over LA, really, they, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what they thought was going to happen with these kids who weren't going to school, who were poor. You know, my, I have a friend who's a teacher and she said from day one, 30% of her class never logged in and they, they don't know where they are. And they don't know what happened to them. They're in, they're in cages. <laughs> Oh, excuse with, me. With Re Biden, Biden Ret t-shirts. Ret retention centers now. It's not cages anymore. <laughs> They're luxury yeah, luxury yeah. detention centers. Oh, good Lord. Wait, so yeah. you said you are working on your book. What's going on with that? Well, I'm it's writing. It's glacial. I, I know what it's like. 
I'm I'm just I'm not disciplined, period. End of okay. story. I am not disciplined about this. I I have not found a system that works in terms of me sitting my ass in a chair every day and getting those thousand words. And but that is a thousand is a lot. That that would be nice. I shoot for 500 and yeah. I'm happy with that. But it's it still would be nice if I could do a thousand. I, it shouldn't be that challenging because it's not like I'm researching anything. Well, it's let me give you some advice. Let me, well, allow me to retort. OK, then we're going to ask you about your giving out advice. Always leave some in the tank. So if you have a thousand in your mind, do 500. So tomorrow you, you're all day. You're thinking about what you're going to write tomorrow. It's already queued up. So when you sit down, you don't have to rev the engine if I'm using yeah. that metaphor correctly. And then you have some left and that way you don't have writer's block and you're excited to sit down and write. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always excited to sit down and write. That's the thing. My, I think the only way I can really do it and I just might have to be a psychotically disciplined person is wake up super early and get it done before I, I merge into the freeway. Because once my day starts, I'm dealing with, I still do everything myself. I book all my podcast guests. I'm managing the business aspect of things. I, it just, the day to day minutia of keeping all of this going, the plates, it, it definitely, is, and promote all the stuff. And yeah. it's definitely, as it grows, that work increases and the, I really am more centered and, um, clear before I log in to business world. So much of it is business. If you told me like, Oh, you're going to be a creative, but you're also going to be a businesswoman. I'm not sure that I would have signed. I love it now. Like I'm getting into, into all the, Wait, I made so many financial mistakes. It's exciting for me to be like, but I'm going to push back a little because you have a dog and Hope is very stuck on her schedule like most dogs, right? So mm -hmm. you know at a certain, I was at your house and you know at a certain time, or at least Hope knows, no, 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 it's playtime. Yeah. And she'll start nipping at hands and start getting <laughs> a little bit aggressive because it's like, it's it's play o'clock. Let's yeah. wrap this up, humans. It's my time now. So you have to do the same thing. You have to say three o'clock, I'm sitting my Irish ass down from this computer <laughs> and I'm not allowed to get up until I get and make it realistic. 500 words. Okay. Don't make it a thousand because that's impossible. Then you're going to have a spiral of like all these bad qualities. But if you sit down, you say, I'm, I, I am at the point for uh, the, the white pill where I'm doing one page a day. Okay. Because it's, it's just so much work and it's, and it's so much research, but I'm fine doing one page a day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I had a good conversation with um, a friend who's also an editor and I had kind of two books that felt like they were competing in my mind. One was there is no bottom and it was like all about my rock bottoms. And then the other one is the accidental pundit. And yeah. she, and she was like, don't save anything. Act like you're only going to write one book and then figure out like you gave me this advice too. don't necessarily you can have an idea but you just sit down and write and yep. it might unfold in a different way yep. than i expected and the funny thing about the actual dental pundit is in going forward as i'm writing it i'm inevitably going backwards like i open it and i'm talking oh, yeah, yeah. about how i really i'm getting my makeup done and i'm like i never wanted any of this and then i'm talking about my dreams and i vividly remember driving across from minnesota to um, LA when I was in my, when I was 20, right out of rehab, the first time I came and I, I was like, I'm going to be sitting on a deck, flipping through scripts, idly smoking weed, looking at dolphins. I'm going to be on set. <laughs> you know, you have all those delusions and I'm like drinking a diet Coke and in the, in the opening, I'm like, to tell you how delusional that was, I don't even like diet Coke. <laughs> like why? Why did I think I'd be drinking a Diet Coke? I hate Diet Coke. It's not even something I like. I just like, that should have been the first red flag that those dreams might not have been realistic. Not, not, it's just so silly. And then it's when I was on the Ben Shapiro election special. So I was talking about how I had these visions of getting my makeup done and you know, there's a little bit of misdirect because I'm like, my dad just had one thing when I moved to L.A. He was like, don't do porn. And so the lady was doing my eyelashes. So for a minute, you're like, oh, crap, is she about to do yeah, yeah. porn? <laughs> um, and then it's like, it's worse than porn. It's Fox News. <laughs> hey, guys, want to talk to you about Fume. 
which is something which I think is a great, great product. What is Fume? F-U-M. It's a natural and non-addictive replacement for smoking, vaping, and nicotine. Nicotine. And nicotine. There's no I in nicotine. If you go to fumessential.com, you can look at their selection. Use promo code MALICE10. You get 10% off your order. What is it? It looks like a steampunk vape. It's a core made of Canadian maple wood. Uh, it's, it's a hollow piece. And they have these cores that you stick in the end that have different flavors and aromas and have different effects. You could have a black pepper core for quitting, peppermint for better breathing, lavender for relaxation. They're made in Alberta, Canada with Canadian maple. So when people want to quit vaping, want to quit smoking, the biggest issue is the ritual. What do they want to do with their hands? Fume allows you to handle that physically addictive aspect, which makes it a lot easier as a half step to quit that awful, awful habit of smoking. It's the worst thing you could be doing to your body. I'm not even joking. If you go to fumessential.com and use code MALICE10, you get 10% off your entire order and you could have white teeth again. Let's get back to the show. Were you, speaking of Fox News, you did Megyn Kelly's show fairly recently. Yeah. Were you, were you nervous talking to her? Because she has a reputation of being a bit of a shark. Um, I was. It was fun to like scoop, not scoop her, but just to surprise her as a journalist. Um, she's really, really good. I was nervous. Yeah. Um, she's very good at interviewing people. I learned a lot from being on the other side of her interview. What'd you learn? Just the way that she would push you. But once she got you there, she was completely comfortable with holding space. You know, okay. it's it's like a very interesting balance of pushing you far enough. And I cried like three times on her podcast. I'm not that. I remember. So the last time I was on Rogan, this like messed up. There was a moment where I was triggered to this thing that happened to me that was really traumatic. And I like dissociated. You would never know it. But I basically was like, whoop, like left my body. Because in that moment, I was like, you are not going to fucking ugly yeah, cry yeah. on Rogan. <laughs> there are not going to be memes of you. No, I was just thinking of the gifts. <laughs> yeah. And there would have been. I'm like, no. Get your shit together, Bridget, and leave your fucking body. <laughs> And it hit me two days later, driving from Austin because we drove two days later, it hit me and I like burst into tears in the car. And I was like, wow, that was fucking wild. It was like yeah. I came back into my body when I felt safe. It was crazy. It was like the craziest actual experience. So um, with Megan, because it was only audio and I also learned that there's something that frees people up when it's only audio. Yeah. I was able to access and felt safe enough to access emotions because I wasn't concerned with looking ugly when I cried or how my I, my makeup running or whatever. So one that was the, really informative. Sorry. One of the reasons I'm an anarchist is because I don't agree with or maybe even don't understand. I'm using that term loosely how anyone could be in a position to tell other people how to run their lives until mm. they figured it out themselves. Mm -hmm. It's like, how are you so sure that you understand how X, Y, and Z works, that you're going to at gunpoint or through the government for someone you've never met to do this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And as a corollary to that, for a long time, I refused to give people advice. I still don't like to, because it's like, who the hell are you to be flapping your gums? You, you don't have a thing. Then I'm like, all right, now I'm at a point where I'm like myself, 25, 25, eight. Uh, I am happy. Like that's my, I'm not, it's not that I don't have bad days, but that is my default state to be content yeah. and happy and have cool things and have a good support network and all this other good stuff. So has there, you're much more on the advice giving train than I am. Has there ever been advice that you've given people that now you look back and you're like, man, I shouldn't have done that. I really screwed them up. Um, that's a good question because when I was at Playboy, I was way more giving advice yeah. than I am now. I, I don't like giving people advice. I don't I can only my advice would be um, when I give advice, I always preference it with saying I only know what worked for me. Yep, this that's may what I be say. what yeah. work for you, but I'm not going to tell anyone how to run their life. People come to me for advice because I don't really judge the situations that they're yeah. in. And I would rather lead them to figuring out what they true. Most people know what they need or want to do. I believe this. It's just they might be clouded by fear in the moment. They might be clouded by expectations other people have put on them that yeah. they don't necessarily agree with. And sometimes it's just having a conversation, getting to what they already know. 
So my advice isn't, it's usually a, a conversation about what they already know about themselves. It's kind of like if you flip a coin and you don't know what to do and you get the coin and you're like, damn it. If it's, you know what you want to do. If you got, you know, you d- wanted it to be the other side of the coin. So that's yeah, yeah. information. Um, I would have to reread a lot of my Playboy columns to answer that question accurately. And I used to always say to my editor, I hate giving advice. Yeah. Like who am I? I giving advice about relationships is the worst thing yeah. because you don't I really think it's between the two people who are in that in those sheets together. You know each other intimately. You know your fears and you know your history. And I can't be like, well, get the hell out of there. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I did that recently. I had a buddy. I I started talking about this on Rogan, and he's basically in a relationship for three years. And he was just asking me for advice, like you know, because he knows who I am. We've never even met, and everything he was saying, I'm like, this is not a healthy relationship. She doesn't support you in your hobbies or your interests. If you're not having intimacy, if you know all this other stuff, it's like, what is? Oh, I think you froze for a second. It's like, what is really the? how is this a give and take when one person is taking the other person's giving? And the the key to me with any relationship, whether it's romantic, friendship, business, if there's no mechanism for resolving disputes, there's really no way forward. You have to be able to get through a fight. Right. Right. So I think that's the yeah, big one. That, well, I have given it. I think there's a difference between giving advice and giving your opinion. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So advice, I would say, because I've had friends where I I lost a friend. Here's a good example. I lost a friend because she was in a relationship with a guy and I didn't like the way he looked at me. It felt scummy. You know, I was just like, I don't like him. I could tell that he was not. I got the like not faithful vibe from him. And he was always off to like um, Southeast Asia. And I was like, I don't know what the hell he's doing there, but I don't trust that there's just something about him. And she was going to marry him. And I was like, don't I straight up was like, do not marry this guy. Wow. He, I, and I rarely will say this, but I was like, I'm willing to risk our friendship to tell you that I don't like him. I don't trust him. And we she was like, OK, well, I'm going to and bye. And then she came home one day and he was fucking their neighbor, their neighbor. Wow. And she ended it and she ended up calling me and was like, you were right. And I appreciate you for telling me that like how you actually felt, because it was one of the things that she it was like in that moment, she's like, <laughs> you know, like you got to give, give her a lot of credit for eating crow because people are usually too whatever it is to own their own stuff. And you can see her, well, I'm sure he wasn't cheating at the time when Bridget said that. So Bridget was just jealous so she could hate both of you. So for her to own that, I think was very impressive. Did you forgive yeah, her? Are you friends again? Yeah, we're still friends. It was, it, I've definitely told people if, if someone's in a toxic relationship and that's obvious, I have no problem being like, get out. <laughs> you need to get out. Because what happens in relationships is they have their own, their own music. And mm-hmm. the people are singing their songs and someone comes in and you're like, this song sucks. <laughs> like, why are you singing this stupid song? And you're like, but I've been singing it for a long time. Yeah, it's terrible. Just stop singing it. Oh my God, the total sidetrack. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the band, The Go-Go's. Mm-hmm. And they did this cover of this like 50s or 60s song called Cool Jerk, which is just horrible. Just absolutely horrible. It's like it was, the original isn't good. Their version isn't good. They had a reunion in 1990 for their greatest hits. They covered it again. And now they're whenever they do it in concert because they can't ever rehearse because they don't live together. That's one of the songs they always do. And and I interviewed Belinda Carlo, who's the lead singer, and I go, "This is such inside baseball." I'm like, "Why do you do Cool Jerk? No one likes it." And she's just like, "Some people ask for it." I go, "No, they don't. Everyone hates it. Stop performing it." She's like, "Yeah, we all hate it too." And it's just, <laughs> it's almost like the kind of challenger. Uh, when the challenger blew up in the '80s, there was we taught we learned about this in business uh, class because like everyone kind of knew something was wrong, but no one had the capacity to say, wait a minute, isn't this going to lead to X, Y, and Z? It becomes wow. a group thing where you defer the consensus of the group. And it's just like, yeah, no, 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 no. This, I don't know what my point is, but basically the song Cool Jerk is horrible in every iteration and no one should ever listen to it. And it's, <laughs> well, I know, I know what your point is, is it's that sometimes people get into a dynamic that's yeah, yeah. toxic and or bad, and it's hard to see that from the outside. And some people stay in that forever and there's nothing you can do about it. You know, they're they're you I grew up in a, a very um 
I always say that my mom and my stepdad were like the skeleton keys to each other's crazy psyche. It was like <laughs> they fully unlocked <laughs> like the capacity within one another. And it was a wild and crazy ride. And I think things have settled. They're still together. It's settled down quite a bit because there aren't teenagers and, you know, the stresses of life that often aggravate mental illness. Yeah. Um, <laughs> There are things they're much their life is much calmer and I think things have calmed down and and to their credit, they've worked through a lot of stuff. But in the at the time it was I mean, I never knew what I was coming home to ever. Is there a does your family understand how you can make rent? Because part of my family doesn't understand how I'm able to make a living doing what I do. It like doesn't make sense to them because I don't go to an office. Yeah, they don't really pay attention to me it's i feel like my <laughs> i feel like my family yeah, they don't care they're gonna see me on like oprah someday and be like wait bridget's on oprah i had no idea why they're am i not listening to this girl what is she <laughs> why do people care about her full circle who is this girl isn't she some twitter celebrity i've only seen her tweets quoted in articles that are about other people <laughs> Other more famous people than her. People that I know. <laughs> now, what is this? I feel like I'm at the petting zoo. I want to see the koalas. <laughs> I didn't come here to see a goat. I have goats yeah. at home, probably. I'm like the imp the the like impala on the safari. There are just so many of them. You're like, oh, this yeah, is okay. just another. Okay, we yeah, see yeah. And now the lions are sleeping. Why are we here? There's bugs. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. It was. It was definitely. Um. I'm not sure that they're, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Like I'm sure people like my brother who is like a blue collar dude and works hard. And I'm sure they're like, how the hell is this girl? What does she do? You know, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Cause it's all ones and zeros. Well, it's all for me. There's a concern that if I'm like a, on a cut that I don't have money for food. And I'm like, this is America. Do you know how little you need to be able to have food? It's mm -hmm. really not a lot. Mm -hmm. So but I, I don't really kind of feel the need to um, educate them otherwise. I lived so, I was so on the rails of poverty, basically all forever for so long. And my cousin, who is my partner on Watkins Welcome and all, all the things on Dumpster Fire, she has to remind me, she's like, Bridget, you had seven dollars in your bank account for over a decade. That was like oh always the balance. And so now I have a savings, you know, yeah, and I yeah. have money that comes in regularly. And because I'm an addict, it's, it's not. And because I have that scarcity yeah. here and I lived hand to mouth for so long, month to month to month and never really knew how I was going to do it and did crazy things for to make rent. Um, I definitely have that feeling that I'm going to be there tomorrow, like you yeah, said. Yeah. And it's also just that idea that it's like never enough because it's really unlimited. You know, that that's the thing that people who work nine to fives get salaries and stuff like that. They don't when they are approaching I saw this even with my husband who he's kind of worked in a nine to five and had a salary. And he's like, I don't understand this because it's terrifying, but it's also like, there's really no cap on what your earning potential is. Yeah. You can just keep going. <laughs> um, it, for the first time in my life last month, I bought, I bought, I paid for like a decent hotel room because yeah. I always thought this is money that's being wasted. Don't spend it. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to treat myself for once in my life. I'm going on Rogan. I'm going to spend a week in Austin, see all my friends. I'm going, and it wasn't like some presidential suite. It was just like a nice hotel room. And I'm really glad I did it. Yeah, because I think sometimes too, you have to um, be in that situation in order to imagine yourself in that situation. Yeah. How can you conceive of being in a hotel room like that or regularly if you've never even been in a hotel like that ever? And it's, yeah. there is something that's nice. You know, one of the things you work towards is like being self sustaining of your own contributions in 12 step. And I feel I'm truly 
Um, I, this is the first year where I'm like, wow, I made this, you know, I, I, I did this. I did have that feeling doing my taxes this year of like a small little acorn seed of pride, yeah, yeah. you know, feeling Good. proud, which was a very strange familiar, unfamiliar feeling. Bridget, we're out of time. What been has been so your, fun. what has been your favorite part of this interview? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. I love the whole, I love talking to you. It feels just so fun. Do I have to pick a favorite? Like the whole thing has been my favorite part of the interview. Nope. You are welcome. 